I'm here with Bogdan today and we will talk about senior backend interview questions. We're gonna jump right in. These are senior level questions that can appear also on mid-level and junior level interview, but you will see how Bogdan will try to answer them as a senior engineer would do. We will start with the first question, Bogdan, what makes an API restful it and what is an example of a non restful api okay so what makes an api restful um probably the most important thing is the way you define your api endpoints and in the architecture style you always want to do it around resources that means pretty much every url should be the plural verb of that resource so if you have an api let's say around payments it should be payments and if you go ahead and start adding things like get payments or delete payments in your URL, that's when you are moving away from RESTful and going into a more of a random uh, endpoint definition. So you always want to stick to resources and then use HTTP verbs to actually define the actions. So when you make a post to payment, it's when you actually create the payment. Okay, and uh, following up on that, what are some advantages, if you can think of, top of your head, of making an API RESTful? versus just a non-RESTful API? Uh, so probably the main advantage is just because it's a standard, it's super easy to consume and super predictable for people that use that API to see how they should request it. Um, and that's that's one of the, the most important things, standardization. So pretty much everybody can consume that. They know how what the shape will be of the request and the response and it gives you all the, all the advantages of standardization. If you don't follow the standards, you'll have to just explain a lot and document a lot of your API because it just looks like something They've never seen before. Cool. Then, Bogdan, nice. Number two, this is also a question that has to do with APIs, uh, but a bit more specific. So, can you explain what content negotiation is? And can you give me an example of content negotiation? Sure. So, content negotiation, it's an HTTP mechanism. Um, and basically, it allows the client to specify which shape of a resource they want. So um, just to give an example, whenever you want to get a CSS file, for example, you could get a plain CSS file as a, as a client, or you could specify with an accept header that you are willing to accept also a JZIP version of that file. And so then the server can decide if they have a compressed version of that to send a compressed one and to let you know in the headers that that version is actually compressed. And they do that with the accept encoding probably with a content encoding header um, and so you know okay i need to decompress this and this allows you to have for example um http compression in uh, compression in http so content negotiation does that now back in the days um i know people also used it for translations of the web pages because back in the days you just had an index html page that was in german let's say and one in english and one in french and there were just different files and depending on the language of the browser they would send you the language in the header and you'd send them a different HTML uh, file. That's back 20 years ago, probably. So that would be content negotiation. You basically get the same resource, but you can specify what format of that same resource. And um, you mentioned one of the advantages of content negotiation is compression. Can you tell me more about that? What, what do you mean by compression and knowing the type of compression I need? How does this translate to an advantage for the backend engineer? Well, basically, the fact you can use compression means you can have a lot more performance because it's usually cheaper to send, to compress something, which would reduce, if you're using JZIP, it probably reduce the size by 70%. Send that over the network and decompress it. It's much faster than sending the original asset. So it's pretty much the standard. And most browsers, whenever they make a request to a CSS resource, they will add this header of, I accept just a JZIP or a broadly compressed version of this asset. And it helps you with scalability by decreasing the throughput, increasing performance in general. Cool. Um, now on to something different. We will talk about databases. And um, this is a pretty standard question. What is the difference between SQL and no SQL databases? Probably the most important one is that in SQL databases, you store tabular data. Um, and that looks a bit like Excel, let's say. Whereas in NoSQL, uh, you can store documents, you can store graphs, but there's not so many relationships between the data. You can think of NoSQL as a as a drawer where you can just throw, any, throw everything. Um, SQL would be like well-classified and well-defined set of drawers where only certain things fit. That's why SQL, uh, SQL database usually have a schema and the schema is really opinionated on how the data should look like and you really need to conform to that schema when you put data in whereas in NoSQL you just throw mostly whatever you want there yeah so let's let's imagine this scenario you are a back-end engineer um your 
product manager is thinking together with a business team to launch a new service and uh, you need a database and this service it's about um, let's say storing um, a certain category of products okay just imagine this what would you use for this purpose would you advise them to um, if they ask you to draft a, a preliminary architecture for this would you use a uh, an SQL database or a no SQL database? What would be your choice and why? I mean, if it's a business logic with relationships, like you mentioned, products and categories, I would expect people to be able to query those and I would expect those relationships to be meaningful and to grow. Then I would go for a relational SQL style database, MySQL, PostgreSQL, uh, because I would assume they would want to query that in a, in a meaningful way. It can be done with MongoDB nowadays too, by using an ORM, but it's just going to be much easier down the road if you keep adding and evolving those relationships. If you already have an SQL database, I would go for SQL as a general uh, rule. When would you use a no SQL database then? I'd probably go for a no SQL database where you're building like an analytic service, where you just send logs and this log, you're logging events, let's say somebody clicked on a button or evoked something. Mm -hmm. You don't really, they, they're, they're not so related. Of course, you will query them at some point, but they're kind of independent events. And uh, there is no need for a schema because sometimes maybe you send extra information in those events. So if you look at any log storage, it's usually an OSQL document database, for example. Uh, that would be a use case where I use NoSQL. No nice, but now, uh, there's one thing that came up in the last few years, and that is GraphQL, right? Data data layer technology. So mm -hmm. my question for you is, you know, have you used GraphQL before? And can you tell me the differences between GraphQL and REST? Um, and what, when would you use GraphQL? What's the use case for GraphQL versus REST, in your opinion? Uh, sure, yeah, I've been using GraphQL in the last five years. And um, I guess the, the main difference with with REST is that in GraphQL, what you offer to our consumers, it's a data layer that they can query as they want. And so all of a sudden the front end can decide how much data to query. Whereas in REST, you have a very well-defined schema of the API around resources. And it happens many times that front-end developers either had to overfetch or underfetch. That means they needed to create a certain view and they wanted, let's say, a list of products they just want to display the title and the price of the product, but they get the full product because that's how the product endpoint is um, defined. The other thing is imagine they would need the product and also different variations of the product. They will need to make an extra request. And that's what we call underfetching. The fact that one endpoint wouldn't give you enough data. So you either get too much or too little. Whereas in GraphQL, the backend offers this data layer that you can write a query against. And that query, it really gives you pretty much everything you need in your review. And so there's many advantages here, but the most important one is that you reduce the need of round trips to the server and you get everything in one request. Sure, you know, um, I really liked what you said with the advantages and, and the flexibility that GraphQL gives you to avoid underfetching or overfetching. But what would be, I'm sure like any technology, this thing has its disadvantages as well. So can you um, tell me, name a few of the disadvantages that GraphQL implies. So I guess the first one that comes to mind is caching. Um, it's just much harder to cache the results of a GraphQL query than it is to cache a simple REST endpoint. Uh, that's also the complexity. Why? Why is it easier to cache a REST answer than, than a GraphQL one? Because at the REST level, you just have to, you have this specific resource and it's extremely easy to, uh, to know if the resource is still fresh or to invalidate the cache. Whereas in GraphQL, you have this nested query. And so you need to think, okay, I need to cache at field level and all of a sudden it just becomes a lot harder of course there's tooling around it and you can maybe work around it but even debugging where caching happen because we have a query again and every you could cache at any level in that query it's mm -hmm. just a lot more complex than than you would in a simple rest api and complexity it's one of the problems with graphql it's a lot more complex to define your schema and write resolvers to resolve the data behind that schema in the back end uh, so that's another thing that um, might be uh, a bit of a a disadvantage, error handling. We have good solutions right now, but it used to be the problem in the beginning. And then when it comes to authentication, pretty much the same. Because people can run queries against our data, uh, against our data layer, they might have different privileges at different levels. So maybe someone starts requesting, they make a full query, but imagine part of that query they're not authorized to see. You need to do kind of a field level authorization and authentication, which is just, it can be done, but it's more complex than 
uh, protecting a REST endpoint. So you're basically exchanging uh, flexibility in your query with complexity of the backend. Yes. And of course, testing, it's also a bit harder. You have in, so many more use graph cases graph. in GraphQL. Yes, you have more use cases. You need spe you need a lot of specialized tooling to deal with this graph structure uh, than you used to have with a REST endpoint where you just send JSON and get JSON back. Now, there is one thing in GraphQL that's pretty uh, specific to GraphQL, and that is the N plus one problem. Um, have you heard about this problem in GraphQL? How would you go about it? Why does it happen and how would you solve it? Uh, yeah, sure. So, yes, we, we had this problem before, uh, especially in the in the very beginning. We uh, we started the implementation of the GraphQL layer. And basically, um, imagine in our case, we had a product. And imagine then the product would fetch, uh, let's say, descriptions in different languages. And you need the information about the language. For every product, you end up making another resolver query to your database, fetching all the languages. And so if you have three products, and each one of them has, I don't know, 20 different languages, you end up making three by 20 queries to the database to fulfill one request. So mm -hmm. you're basically um, making a, a, a denial of service attack on your database. You could literally uh, bring your database down if you don't solve that. And the solution to that is to basically batch queries. So rather than sending those 60 queries, you accumulate, you batch all the IDs of all the languages you need and all the products, and you send them in a single query, and then you distribute the results back to your resolver functions, which put together the graphical answer. And you can do that with a couple of libraries. Uh, we use data loaders in the past, and oh. it did a pretty good job. Awesome. Bogdan, now a pretty standard question for a backend engineer. Uh, could you name three solid principles? And I would also love, you know, if you used one of those principles, in your backend code, um, give me some examples of you know when they come in handy and why you used. Them. I think we have S for um, the separation, a uh, single responsibility, the single responsibility uh, principle. Uh, then the L was list code substitution. O stands for open close. Uh, mm -hmm. S O L I for um, interface segregation and the D for dependency injection. Um, Nice. I did use a lot of dependency injection in the past to make code more testable. So rather than depending directly by using an import onto something, you can provide it as a, as an argument at runtime. So you can either build a class and provide that dependency in the constructor of the class or as a function argument in JavaScript. And what that would allow you to do is that um, at test time, for example, you could provide a mock implementation of that dependency uh, and in a lot easier way than if you import it directly. So I use that a lot. I think Nest.js implements that by default and a lot of the backend frameworks like .NET and uh, Java Spring Boot, they, they use that by default, dependency inversion. Mm -hmm. mm, from, you know, can you, can you tell me another example with another of those principles? I guess one good example would be the MVC pattern where we split the architecture in layers uh, based on the uh, single responsibility principle. So you have the model and then you have the view layer and you mm -hmm. have the controller that does the business logic. And that's basically a result of getting, you know, your spaghetti back in code and applying the single responsibility principle. That would be another awesome. uh, example. Amazing. Um, cool. Now on to a bigger and uh, more high level topic, which is uh, microservices. So uh, can you tell me what microservices are and, you know, what are some advantages and disadvantages? I would say, hey, let's name uh, three of each, three advantages and three disadvantages of microservices. Okay, um, so to put it simply, microservices is basically when you split a monolith, like you have our own backend service that grew quite a lot, and there's so many different responsibilities, and we decide, hey, let's just separate these two things. So they live independently, each with their own database, and mm -hmm. they are all, you know, they're completely separated, and they can call each other over the network through their REST or GraphQL APIs. Um, so basically, you, you take your service-oriented architecture, but you distribute it across the network in small single single small services and that allows you to scale them independently to deploy them independently to have different teams developing them independently so it allows you to mm -hmm. kind of grow your team um and it's been it's became very very popular uh the one drawback is that as they say the number one law of distributed system is don't distribute your systems uh the fact that we distribute our systems means um we will have to care a lot about security when we call other services. All of a sudden we have latency because we're doing this over HTTP. So everything takes longer. It's also much harder to access data over the network. Um, and again, you have all this complexity of deploying, building pipelines, maintaining all those independent services. So it's what they call the microservices tax, where you end up maintaining all these services and paying a huge price. So you're getting it to be careful uh, that when you split, it actually pays off. Understood. So as a disadvantage, um, complexity and expensive. 
to maintain. Yes, you could say security, it's another one. You need to have HTTPS certificates that you rotate all of the services. They need to authenticate with each other and they need to find each other. So all of a sudden you have to solve all these problems. Whereas in the past, you're just making a, a call to a different module in your code base to get some data from that extra, uh, from that other service. But then looking at those um, advantages and disadvantages that you mentioned, you know, when would you as a backend engineer, let's say you are the lead backend engineer, um, you know, our backend service is growing and growing. Mm, when would you recommend a transition towards microservices? Very good question. I would say it depends on how you want to also distribute your team because uh, we follow the Conway law, which means the system will look as the team building the system. So if the headcount grows and we see there's this, like two different feature teams we want to build and they're all concerning different pro uh, parts of the product, then it makes sense to talk to the team and split the services accordingly. So they can actually, uh, the best would be if they can actually deliver and deploy the services independently. So you are working in parallel and you don't need to have something that I saw in some of the teams in my past, a stand up with 15 people, uh, a lot of shared knowledge. It's, it's just impossible to work when you're past 12 people. So you need to split because you want to scale your team mostly. Um, the other situation would be if you imagine you're always um, seeing in our system that there's a certain part of it that gets a lot of traffic, but there are other parts that don't. But because that part gets a lot of traffic, we need to scale it all together. So all of a sudden we're throwing a lot of resources, whereas we could just split those things and scale only the service that needs more traffic. So you save up in your infrastructure. And the third scenario would be if you don't want to have a single point of failure. So because we are operating in a monolith, if someone breaks anything, if your database goes down for any reason, you're just down. Whereas in microservices, it's a bit more, the whole system, it's a bit more reliable. Um, it's a bit more resilient because you can recover from failure because failure is somehow isolated to one service. In your, in your experience working with uh, monoliths and microservices, were companies doing the switch to microservices too early or were they rushing? And what would you recommend let, let's say, again, let's go back to the product manager um, and the executive team is getting around. They are they are thinking, is it worth it to have a migration scenario here? What have you seen in the past and what you, would you recommend to um, to a team looking to, to migrate? I would say the most common question, uh, the most common mistake, it's uh, we were splitting too early and um, we end up creating so many services and no one would end up maintaining them because there's just too many. Um, and so there's this saying that if your team cannot build a modular monolith, they definitely cannot build microservices. So you really want to look at your monolith and make sure that you can separate services inside the monolith and really understand what the problem is before we go in and start throwing at the solution. I think there was a lot of hype around microservice architecture. Everybody was doing it, but then there was a bit of a backslash and people are right now using monoliths and really considering, but be very conservative in your decision because it's an expensive decision to make. And it's quite hard usually once you made it to roll back. Also, we have a lot more tooling about how to manage a monorepo, right, which, which uh, helps people avoid like, migrating too fast. Um, cool, Bogdan, thank you so much. This was it for today. We will come back with um, another series on software senior backend engineering interview questions. As for you, what I want is number one, is there any question that you want us to cover in our next video? Drop it in the comments and Bogdan and I will pick it and cover it in a next backend engineering series. Um, and number two, if you're looking for a place to accelerate your engineering career, then check out also the link in comments, our free community. There you will have exclusive access to Bogdan and I, and you can ask us questions directly, and you can also share your uh, insights with a community of like-minded developers that are also interested into growing. As for Bogdan and I, we will see you in the next one.